Andrew is presently chairman of the uh, Bar of uh, England and Wales, and he is a bencher of the Middle Temple. He was leader of the Western Circuit. Uh, he is um, also served as a, rec a recorder of the Crown Court, and he is a very distinguished lawyer with enormous experience. And we look forward to his hearing today what he's got to say on these issues. One of the great privileges of my current position uh, has been that in the context of the Brexit earthquake, um, I've been able to watch at reasonably close quarters how politicians, civil servants, uh, bureaucrats or eurocrats, as of course they're called by the tabloids, engage with each other uh, in what a sympathiser might describe as a, as a conversation or negotiations or dialogue. But uh, sometimes I think it may be more accurately likened to one of those pieces of contemporary dance uh, between combatants, where the method seems by turns dramatic, tortuous, physically painful, and ultimately uh, uh, incoherent. Uh, and as with contemporary dance, it's sometimes difficult to work out how much of it has been choreographed and how much of it has been left to improvisation. But just try to take a bird's eye view for the moment. Once the referendum result had sent the UK down um, an unexpected side stream off a sedate river that we had hitherto been more or less gently floating along together with our EU neighbours. Once that vessel had begun to travel down rapid but uncharted waters, the language of those with an eye to history began to emerge. And so it is that the piece of legislation that's going to do the actual deed was to be known aptly enough as the Great Repeal Bill. But ambitions uh, since became a, a little more modest because it was next referred to simply as the repeal bill. And when it actually emerged, it, it is, as you know, called the EU withdrawal bill. Um, the great repeal conjures up ringing of church bells on exit day, whereas the EU withdrawal bill seems more subdued, more, more tail between the legs. But, but uh, let me be more serious because what, after all, is in the name? Just a few thoughts about the bill itself, because I think until one understands that, other things are, are less easy to understand. The essential mechanism of Clause 1 is this. The European Communities Act 1972 is repealed on exit day. Clauses 2 and 3 save all EU-derived domestic legislation, which will continue to have effect unless or until it is repealed. And the same status is given to all direct EU legislation and regulations, but not to any EU directives. So the Bar Council of England and Wales, the body I currently lead, whilst maintaining neutrality on the actual merits or demerits of exiting the Union, is concerned, as I hope you would expect us to be, about citizens' rights and our abilities to challenge decision-making. And we have three principal concerns. First, the bill removes the opportunity for UK citizens to challenge EU law, which is thus brought into English law. Um, and so it amounts to a reduction in the rights currently enjoyed by UK citizens and will afford them less protection against the power of the state. And to borrow from the political language of the Brexit campaign, some rights are not so much being brought home as abolished. Um, clause 3, which says um, EU legislation is to be incorporated, is subject to a particular provision in, a sh in Schedule 1, Paragraph 1, which expressly prevents a UK court, after exit day, from making any decision about the validity of those instruments. So a pre-exit EU instrument that interferes, say, with data privacy, if it's found invalid in the EU for incompatibility with Article 16 of the TFEU, for example, that defective instrument will continue to apply in the UK as a result of Clause 3, and UK citizens will be unable to use domestic courts to challenge it. So, as I say, on the face of it, the bill reduces the rights of UK and, of course, non-UK EU citizens and their protection against the power of the state. Secondly, ministers are given an alarming amount of power. Clause 7 enables them to make regulations to, quote, prevent, remedy or mitigate any deficiency in retained EU law. And that includes an open-ended power to make, quote, any provision that could be made by an act of parliament. 
and this so-called Henry VIII power to repeal or amend legislation relates to whole tracts of the statute book, not just to those acts that implement the EU legislation. Thirdly, drawing our judges into politics. Clause 6 is unsatisfactory because it risks politicization of the judiciary if it's not more con tightly constrained. It presently reads, a court or tribunal need not have regard to anything done on or after exit day by the European courts, but it may do if it considers it appropriate to do so. And Lord Newberger, our outgoing president of the Supreme Court and our recently retired Lord Chief Justice, are joining the call on the government to state its, more, its position more explicitly. As Lord Newberger put it, if the government doesn't express clearly what the judges should do about the decisions of the ECJ after Brexit, then the judges will simply have to do their best but to blame the judges for making the law when Parliament has failed to do so would be unfair. And as drafted, the bill leaves the government free subsequently to say, well, the judges are interpreting this in a way that is causing all the difficulty. And Parliament, we say, should think again. It might, for example, reduce the dangerous ambiguity by instructing UK courts to take account of post-Brexit ECJ decisions when they are relevant to the proceedings. That's language borrowed from the equivalent section of the Human Rights Act in relation to the Strasbourg Convention. So those are three aspects of the bill. There are many others, but the principal ones about which we are raising concerns. Where will it all end? Um, are we in safe hands in parliamentary committees and in the House of Lords um, as the bill continues its passage through Parliament? But, I mean, everything, in a sense hangs on the progress of that bill. And you will know the politics are a little uncertain at present and predicting what will happen is difficult. Um, there are amendments being tabled uh, at committee stage um, and those amendments are fast and furious and the outcome still unclear. So look, coming away from that bird's eye view, I uh, hope it's useful just to look at a, a relatively small thing when viewed as a proportion of the whole but with, us, with so many other aspects um, caught up in our withdrawal, by no means a small thing in terms of the potential consequences, not just for the UK, but for our European neighbours, for whom there are mirror implications for not getting it right, and chosen the European arrest warrant as a way to try to illustrate uh, the topic. Of course, that's just one, the warrant of a package uh, of, or a host of measures, which promote security and cross-border cooperation in law enforcement. Um, and I referred earlier to the Brexit dance. The future of the warrant, if I just call it that for short, rather than the European arrest warrant, the future of the warrant serves as, as a good example of, of that genre. And just a few background notes as to the warrant, because I suspect, although most of you uh, know what it is and why it matters, it may still just be worth taking a few moments to sketch its value and to dwell on some figures. So the warrant speeds up extradition process between EU member states. It used to take a year plus to extradite someone before the warrant was introduced, and of course those suspects with resources could spin it out for years and often frustrate the process altogether. Now the average across Europe is just 48 days. A suspect must be handed over within a maximum of 90 days after arrest. For a warrant to be valid, the suspect must be accused of an offence occurring a maximum penalty of at least a year or have received a sentence of at least four months. Critically, there is no analysis of evidential sufficiency. The warrant is a mutual cooperation instrument that's based on the principle of mutual recognition. This means that if one member state makes a decision to extradite an individual to face a trial or serve a sentence, that decision must be respected and applied throughout the European Union. And the basis of the warrant is an EU framework decision made in June 2002, which superseded the previous extradition arrangements between member states as set out in the Council of Europe's 1957 Convention on Extradition. The framework decision was implemented in the UK by the Extradition Act of 2003 and it came into force on the 1st of January 2004. 
What are the statistics? The UK surrenders about 1,000 individuals a year to other EU member states under a warrant. On average, we issue about 200 warrants seeking extradition of individuals to the UK. Thinking about Ireland and digging down into those figures, um, between the years 2010 and 15, in those years, those warrants that we issued included, um, sorry, first of all, just as it were, across Europe, 41 wanted for murder, 61 for rape, and three for terrorism. In relation to Ireland, wanted by us from you, an average of about 15 a year, wanted by you from us three times as many, about an average of 45 a year. The virtues of the warrant are speed, efficiency, cost, all produced effectively by uniformity of process and by a lack of the investigation into evidential sufficiency and a deliberately tight timetable. Of course, not everybody is happy with it. Uh, in particular, sending own nationals to another country to face a trial raises strong feelings everywhere. It's captured, I think, best um, in uh, a Daily Telegraph uh, column, which I happened to find, 2012, British citizens have been extradited to countries such as Bulgaria and Romania, whose legal systems cannot be described as fair or free from the taint of corruption. Britons have ended up serving long sentences in ghastly prisons after trials that would never have resulted in guilty verdicts in the UK. Indeed, the allegations would never even have led to prosecutions. I don't know if any of that is right, but you understand the sentiment, and of course it's everywhere, not just in the UK. I'm sure it will be in places uh, here. It's certainly very much uh, the case that there, is, there are those feelings in other member states. But whatever the misgivings of some, and by comparison with what it replaced, most of those charged with the responsibility of national security and with bringing offenders to justice have a sincere belief that the warrant has proved to be a vital tool. What about the politicians and their stance in the dance? In 2014, having secured an opt-out, uh, following parliamentary debate, the UK elected to rejoin 35 measures, one of which was the warrant, and 16 Conservative MPs voted against. One of them was David Davis, and of course he's our minister for exiting the EU. At the time, the then Home Secretary, now our Prime Minister, said, since the Lisbon Treaty came into effect, the UK has signed up to 90 new Justice and Home Affairs measures, accepting the jurisdiction of the CJU over them. We face the same choice today, whether to accept the jurisdiction of the European Court over the small package of pre-Lisbon measures that we wish to remain part of, so that our law enforcement agencies can continue to use those powers to fight crime and keep us safe, or reject those measures and accept the risk to public protection that that involves. We must act in the national interest to keep the British public safe. Well, the national interest, of course, hasn't changed, but the politics have. Uh, in a pre-referendum speech delivered in April of 2016, still then Home Secretary, um, she noted that the warrant was one of the measures that, quotes, makes a positive difference in fighting crime and preventing terrorism. And she made similarly supportive remarks before the Home Affairs Committee. But in her speech to the Conservative Party conference in October last year, the Prime Minister made it clear that we, the UK, are to have no truck with the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. First, we thought she might be muddling up Luxembourg with Strasbourg. And as you know, that happens. But she wasn't. And leaving the jurisdiction of the ECJ has become a so-called red line. But fondness for the warrant has not entirely dissipated since the referendum. As recently as March, the new Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, said, the warrant is an effective tool that is essential to the delivery of effective judgment on murderers, rapists, and paedophiles, and it is a priority for the government to ensure that we remain part of the agreement. So can the UK remain part of the warrant arrangement without submitting to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice? How, in other words, do we square leaving with staying? Uh, Guy Verhofstadt, the European Parliament's chief Brexit negotiator, 
uh, said mid-August, we seek a close relationship with the UK after Brexit, particularly on justice and security uh, matters. Criminals and terrorists must not be the beneficiaries of Brexit. However, we are also determined that the legal order of the European Union is respected. The European arrest warrant is an instrument of European Union law and will therefore continue to be overseen by the European Court of Justice. The essence of the problem of leaving the, C, the, the, the Court of Justice, captured by Professor Sir Francis Jacobs, Queen's Counsel, Advocate General at the European Court from 1988 to 2006, who said this, it cannot be expected that disputes of the kind in issue that currently come before the CJEU can be resolved exclusively by UK courts. On the contrary, they are increasingly likely to be settled by transnational courts and tribunals, and such means of settlement can no longer be sensibly regarded as an affront to UK sovereignty. Indeed, in order to be effective, such a system was bound, he said, to encroach on national sovereignty. On the 23rd of August, um, in a, one of its recent, uh, there's been a flurry of position papers from the government, as you may know. Uh, on the 23rd of August, the government reaffirmed that the UK will no longer be subject to direct jurisdiction of the CJEU. And then on Sunday night, whilst preparing for this talk, I heard that a new position paper in relation to this very subject was going to be issued yesterday. So I thought I'd cancel my flight, as it would all be <laughs> terribly clear once we'd read the position paper, and this talk would be unnecessary. But I'm glad I didn't, because uh, although it was published yesterday, and I'll come to it in a moment, uh, it's still the position, apparently, that the European Court is to have no direct jurisdiction even in relation to justice or security matters. You have to read, I think, a little between the lines in relation to these position papers, and I've just highlighted three or four passages. Let me just give them to you. One option for future EU-UK cooperation in this area would be to limit cooperation to those areas where a precedent for cooperation between the EU and third countries already exists. Whilst this would be one possible approach, it would result in a limited patchwork of cooperation falling well short of current capabilities. Next passage I highlight. Both on trade and on the Schengen Association, agreements there are... Sorry, I'll start that again. Both on trade and on the Schengen Association agreements, there are examples of the EU's relationship being based on overarching legal frameworks that support close and dynamic cooperation with third countries. Neither of these arrangements involve direct jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union in those third countries. The UK sees a strong case for building on those models to develop a strategic agreement that provides a comprehensive framework for future security, law enforcement, criminal justice cooperation between the UK and the EU. This would be a treaty between the UK and the EU providing a legal basis for continued cooperation between the UK and the EU in this vital area and could include provisions on scope and objectives, the obligations for each side and what mechanisms should apply to resolve disputes. The UK believes the right approach is to explore and design this new model with the EU as part of wider discussions on the deep and special partnership. And then last... Uh, sorry, penultimate quote, in doing so, the ambition should be to construct a model that, a number of bullet points which I think are aspirational and not very helpful, but the last bullet point, provide, pro provides for dispute resolution over, for example, interpretation or application of the agreement. The UK will no longer be subjected to direct jurisdiction of the CJEU, meaning consideration will need to be given to dispute resolution as part of the new relationship. A little later... In particular, it will be important to ensure that the new relationship with the EU ensures ongoing effective cooperation between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I mean, aspirations aside, what is the blunt reality? Once the UK has withdrawn from the EU and the framework decision ceases to apply, there seem to me to be three alternative options for future extradition arrangements between the UK and member states. The first go back to relying on the European Convention on Extradition of 1957. The second, and that's the aspiration in the statement I've just read, conclude an agreement with the EU 27 en bloc as one, a treaty of some sort or other. 
Thirdly, conclude bilateral agreements with each EU member state. Option one, the 57 Convention. Four key problems, it seems to me. First of all, the fact that many member states have repealed domestic legislation underpinning the Convention since the establishment of the warrant system. Uh, secondly, uh, there was, as you may recall, an exemption permitting the refusal of one's own nationals. Thirdly, the increased cost. And fourthly, the potential for delays. If we're not able to fall back on the Convention, what sort of agreement could be reached with the EU27? Will some form of arbitration do it, as posited by some? The problem, of course, with arbitration is it's not transparent, and there may be difficulties with enforcement, and arbitration doesn't give rise to a body of case law. If you need to enforce criminal judgments, the only dispute mechanism I suggest that you can really have is a court. Uh, and we're talking, of course, let's remember, about reviewing decisions affecting the liberty of the individual. And perhaps Sir Francis takes, uh, correct, uh, understandably takes the view that the UK government's use of the language of arbitration is, quote, totally inappropriate as a concept in the context of, the, of formal reviews of, of decisions made pursuant to the warrant. What about the EFTA court? I appreciate there are in this room uh, experts on that subject, but you will know that the EFTA court operates in parallel to the Court of Justice of the European Union. The EFTA court has jurisdiction with regard to EFTA states party to the EEA agreement, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. The, C the A difference is that the CJEU's opinions are binding on domestic courts in EU member states, while those of the EFTA court are only advisory. The EFTA court consists of three judges, one nominated by each of the EFTA states, party to the EEA agreement, and of course it also sits in Luxembourg. Now to those who say that there must be some doubt as to whether the EU27 will be willing to agree with this arrangement for the warrant, I suppose it might be said that the EFTA model does demonstrate that the EU is prepared to trust foreign judges enforcing a form of EU law in their own lands. But it should be noted that at present, of course, the uh, EFTA model only applies to internal market-related disputes. Its jurisdiction was not expanded to cover the Norway and Iceland agreement, which I'm just about to come, uh, and of course it could have been. Um, the government have never as far as I know, given this option serious consideration, if they have done, not publicly. And let's face it, an EFTA court would remain, in the eyes of true Brexiteers at least, a foreign court. What about the Norway-Iceland option? Uh, what is it? Um, it's an agreement similar to the European arrest warrant with a uniform procedure, a simplified procedure. It's, it took 13 years to negotiate. It does include two discretionary bars on extradition, an option for all parties to refuse to extradite their own nationals, and also a political offence exception. But other than that, you know, word for word, if you're dealing with a nitty-gritty the wording on the form is identical to the European arrest warrant form. So it has that strength of similarity of procedure. Would it take 13 years to negotiate a bilateral agreement of this sort, like Norway and Iceland did? Probably not, because we already use the European arrest warrant, and we have the Norway-Iceland model to hand. And who wants a third model? when uniformity of process is fundamental to success of the concept. Ideally, we don't want three varieties. As to how the norway Eisen model operates, two things are of note. Article 36 of it, which says, any dispute between either Iceland or Norway and EU member states concerning interpretation or the application of this agreement may be referred by a party to the dispute to a meeting of representatives of the governments of the respective governments with a review to settlement within six months, a form of dispute resolution. What about the European Court in the Norway-Iceland option? How does 
its decisions affect the agreement and what is their status in Norway and Iceland. Article 37, the contracting parties shall keep under constant review the development of the case law of the CJEU and that of the competent courts of Iceland and Norway. And to this end, there should be a mechanism set up to ensure regular mutual transmission of such case law. The ultimate objective is to arrive at a uniform application and interpretation as is possible for the provisions of this agreement. Uh, it's pragmatic. It sounds European in philosophy. Uh, a common lawyer like me struggles with the inherent lack of certainty, but given what's at stake, let's get over that. Why not then, the norway Iceland model? Well, first, the UK is in a different position to Norway and Iceland as it's not a member of Schengen, as you know. And when thinking of the free movement of people, is there an interrelation? One of the justifications for the European arrest warrant system is the need for an integrated approach to judicial cooperation in the context of free movement of people. And it follows that the extent to which it's considered necessary or desirable to be part of such a system may depend on the extent to which any post-Brexit settlement involves the acceptance of the free movement principle. So the House of Lords EU committee put it this way, even if something like this can be achieved, quotes, it is conceivable that the EU 27 may not be willing to waive the right to refuse to extradite their own nationals outside the framework of the European arrest warrant and without the concept of EU citizenship that underpins it. Thirdly, bilateral agreements. If the bloc negotiations with the EU27 fail, third option to negotiate separate bilateral agreements with each EU member state, as is permitted under the uh, extradition convention. Um, and, of course, there may be mutual advantages which encourage us to enter into bespoke arrangements with certain countries with which we have a close relationship and, most obviously, Ireland. Um, or from whom we receive a very high number of extradition requests. And we receive an extraordinarily large number of extradition requests from Poland. We have a population of about a million Poles in the UK. Um, but, you know, we have a deadline. Uh, two years is up in March 2019, and negotiating 27 bilateral agreements is akin to impossible. What is the government actually doing? Um, of course, I'm not from the government, and I don't know. But um, emerging as little more than gossip, but in the newspapers, is a proposal, I gather, for a new ad hoc legal commission involving a Supreme Court judge, an ECJ judge, and one from a third neutral country to rule on each extradition in some way. It's newspaper language. I don't understand it very much. You will know that the Labour Party, in its manifesto, gave a commitment to retain membership of the various agencies uh, that deal with uh, cross-border security and expressly uh, indicate is a, a desire to continue the European arrest warrant arrangements. What is going to happen if nothing is sorted out or, or there are at the very least no satisfactory transitional arrangements? We speak of a cliff edge and it's not a bad idea to do so because it concentrates minds. But when thinking of cliffs, uh, don't think of them only as depicted by our white cliffs of Dover, because every EU state that benefits from cooperation and extradition is also facing its own cliff edge in relation to uh, extradition arrangements with the UK. And for some countries who don't place great store on that, uh, it may be relatively unimportant, but for some, and perhaps Ireland is one, the cliff is of notable proportions. To balance the imagery, though, with something less vivid, can, I think it's important to concede that it's possible to overstate the extent of the problem. If we're being thoroughly pragmatic for a moment, you might ask, well, would it really matter if we all continue to follow something akin to the warrant but don't submit in the UK to the jurisdiction of the European Court? After all, if you in Ireland want an alleged murderer back here to face trial, are you going to fuss if the ECJ doesn't have jurisdiction in the UK if we're willing to play ball under the rules and hand them over as we've done for the last decade or more? It's more difficult, of course, when you look at it the other way around. Um, 
But it's perhaps worth remembering that before we elected to opt in in 2014, there had been a period of some years when the warrant was operating when the CJEU did not have express jurisdiction in relation to extradition. And the domestic courts were perfectly able to develop case law without there being any significant divergence. And it may be that one overstates the risk of divergence hereafter. Trouble is, of course, that once we've left the EU, we can, we can imagine the point being taken pretty quickly given the change of the status of the citizens in question. And I may be wrong, but I think it may have already happened that the point has been taken in your own jurisdiction by some of your creative lawyers. Um, we could perhaps approach this in a pragmatic, less purist way. We have a warrant. Everyone's got used to it. Let's not sweat about jurisdiction of the ultimate court until we have to. Trouble is, though, that even though there may be no substantial difference in the fairness of the process faced by those extradited between us, the, polit the politicization of the subject caused by the politics surrounding Brexit has rendered extradition between the UK and EU member states once more possibly a stage upon which entirely wrongly, in my view, politicians may again want to play a part. Um, instead of allowing respect between judicial authorities to prevail in this area, which is an area, after all, that's about the delivery of justice. All of which takes me back to the EU withdrawal bill, clause 6.1. After exit day, a court or tribunal need not have regard to anything said or done by the European Court, another EU entity, or the EU, but may do so if it considers it appropriate to do so. If that wording remains, perhaps the courts, our courts, the UK courts, will consider it always appropriate to have significant regard to decisions of the European Court in relation to the European arrest warrant, given that it is axiomatic that the transaction is with an EU state subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court. So, um, Concluding, it seems to me that every serious-minded person seems to agree that we should not be playing politics with cross-border security and justice. But regrettably, our politics is at play. If not, an agreement on this topic could already have been separated out uh, and provisionally at least sorted. The politics in the UK include the fact that those that currently uh, lead us have determined that the result of the referendum vote requires them to leave, uh, sorry, to give the European Court of Justice no role in our domestic future. The politics of the EU 27, my take on it, is a sense that the UK must not be seen to have its cake and eat it. But when something very important is at stake, we need, of course, not mere politicians, but statesmen and women, and those who can rise above the politics and the warrant and related issues concerning cross-border security and justice uh, presents an opportunity for leaders of that calibre, uh, and I suggest their time has surely come.